Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is James Cadman. I work for Action Sustainability, uh, the, the organization behind the Supply Chain Sustainability School. Uh, welcome to this morning's webinar. We're going to be talking to you today about how to break the cycle of climate change leading to forced labor. Uh, we've got a, a few presentations and then an opportunity for some uh, Q&A with our speakers. Uh, so do get involved in that. I'm just going to share my slides um, as a couple more people join the webinar. Great. Can I see a nod from someone that they're being shared? That's great. Thanks, Helen. So, yes, we're going to be talking about um, how we can break that cycle between climate change potentially leading to forced labour and where there are examples of it and what we can actively do about it. Um, so we have uh, an agenda of three speakers this morning and then an opportunity for you to pose your questions as well uh, through the Q&A function. Uh, we're going to do a, a quick round of welcome and introductions, um, and then we'll jump into a, a Menti poll, which I'll take you through the ins and outs of in a minute. Uh, for those of you who've done any menti metering on the supply chain school, uh, you'll know all about it, but I'm sure there's a couple of you who haven't. Um, so we'll do that. We'll ask you three questions. Uh, then we'll move into a presentation from myself about climate change and uh, what the ins and outs of it. Um, we are all very much aware of the urgency, but some of the detail in that, some of the, some of the numbers, some of the science behind it. Uh, then we'll have another quick menti poll, another three questions before I hand over to my colleague Helen Carter, uh, who's lead consultant in procurement, uh, modern slavery and human rights at Action Sustainability. Uh, and like I say, many of you will know Helen through the Supply Chain School's work. Uh, and then we'll move to our guest, Matt Galvin from TfL, uh, Responsible Procurement Manager, who's going to take us through his presentation about what TfL is doing on human rights and public procurement. And then we'll have an opportunity to have some questions from, from yourselves in the audience. Um, just so you know, we are recording this uh, webinar, so if you wish to look at it later or you want to share the link with colleagues, by all means do so. We'll make that link available. We'll also make the slides available as a PDF afterwards as well, um, should you wish to look back through those. Uh, so do take notes if you wish or screenshots, but you will get the actual PDF at some point. And then, like I say, there'll be um, a Q&A session. So if we go to the, uh, the Mentimeter, first of all, we'd like to get some of your views. That'd be really good. Um, so the instructions are on the screen. You simply go to www.menti.com and you can do that on another browser tab um, on your laptop, on your computer, or you can go to your smartphone and open up a, um, a browser tab there. Uh, there's also an app. If you want to download the app, you can do that. Um, but the simplest way we found is just go to a, um, a browser tab and put in menti.com. Um, ideally on Chrome or Firefox, for some reason, Microsoft Edge doesn't like it quite as much. And then you'll see there's a, we're requesting a code, um, an eight digit code, 86166457. Don't leave the Zoom call that you're in now. Uh, you can keep that open and it'll run in parallel. We'll take you through a few questions. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna move that. So yeah, the Menti code has been uh, placed in the chat box as well um, by Helen. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm just gonna flip my screens to to uh, Mentimeter. Helen, can you just give me a nod that you can see that as well now, the questions? Thank you, super. So we've got the first question. I'm just going to start the, uh, the polling. Does your organisation have a carbon reduction strategy? Yes, in development, no or don't know. And what you should see on your screen is um, an option to choose one of four answers. You should just get four radio buttons that look something like this, like on my screen. So we'll just give it a, a few more minutes. We've got 30 odd participants. So when the numbers get somewhere near to 30, we will um, close the voting. We're at 15, so about half of you. This is all anonymous, by the way. So don't worry if you've put in an answer of don't know, you're not gonna get a knock on the door from me, boss saying, why don't you know? And similarly, don't sweat it. Don't worry about going to find out immediately if you have got one.
I can just see someone saying that Menti's not working. Yes, um, it, it generally works for most people, but as I say, there's a, a, occasionally, if you've got a, a corporate firewall or a, a different kind of browser, it sometimes doesn't work. If, if you do have access to a smartphone, that's normally the best way, because if it's a personal phone, you don't get caught up in um, corporate IT uh, security. Okay, so we're getting up to 19 or 20. Uh, over half have got uh, um, an actual strategy and another quarter have got one in development. So we're looking at three quarters are doing uh, some good work on that. That's wonderful. Great. Okay, so if we push on to the second question, this is a word cloud. So you can get three options to um, write in some words, uh, maybe a few more, actually five options. Uh, what are the biggest challenges your supply chain faces in supporting your reduction targets for carbon? As I say, you've got some, you don't have to use all five, but you've got five boxes where you can put in some text. You can do 25 characters in each. So a short sentence or a couple of words, uh, and then it will appear on the screen as a word cloud. Um, if by chance you happen to spell it exactly the same as somebody else, it will come up bigger. The font will be bigger. Fuel is loud and clear at the moment. Measurement, transparency. Yeah, measurement is a big one. Just while people are putting in uh, their, their responses, the Supply Chain School and Action Sustainability regularly run webinars on uh, data measurement, data capture, analysis, that kind of thing, using different tools. Okay, they're coming in thick and fast now. Steel and concrete, so a lot about materials, the embodied carbon of materials, definitely. Um, engagement, yeah, cost is in there. I'm surprised that's not bigger at the moment, but cost is definitely in there. Uh, knowledge of your strategy as the client. Yes, so there's a communications piece. It's not just the numbers and the, and the, and the science. It's the um, it's the communications that go with it. Great. Someone else has put in cost, which is good. Um, this is where I get a crick neck by having to read through 90 degrees. Uh, cool. Okay. The cost of alternative solutions. Yes, often there is an alternative solution, but the cost is sometimes prohibitive or the availability is prohibitive. Yeah, and people don't really care. Yeah, that's an important one there, yes. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna push on to the third question. Is net zero carbon explicitly part of your procurement and contracts process? Again, you've got four options. Yes, in development, no, don't know. Do you know where, when you go out to supply chain that there's some kind of question in there about carbon reduction, energy efficiency, um, reducing embodied impacts, many different words and phrases for that. So this is interesting to compare to that first question about do you have a carbon reduction strategy? 75% of you said yes, effectively. Um, and now we're getting a, a, a different outcome coming out of here that uh, the supply chain aspect of that is, um, is less in development or it's, it's further behind. Okay, so yes, we're looking at 14 here uh, out of, so kind of three quarters again that say it's in development or we don't have one. A couple more coming in. Okay, super. Thank you. So that's just some uh, some good uh, polling of, of you guys to understand where we're at and what we need to do. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. We're going to have three more questions later when we get on to Helen's presentation. So keep your mentee kind of open. It shouldn't log you out. Um, but if it does, we will give you the pass number again, the, the eight digit code again. Okay, I'm just going to move on to uh, my brief presentation. If I just change a few boxes around. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you've got any questions, put them in the Q&A box um, as we go along and we'll pick them up at the end uh, between the three speakers. Um, so yeah, if you do have any questions, do pick those up. So uh, I'm going to take you on a, a fairly quick canter through climate change. Like I said earlier, I'm sure many of you are well aware of the issues around climate change, but I just want to put some more numbers and facts behind it rather than just the, the immediate urgency that we all face. Um, there's some startling statistics out there that, that really, even though I've seen them many, many times, still make me uh, concerned on one level, but also sit up and pay attention to this. Uh, and apologies now, I do like a good graph. They do speak a thousand words. So what you're looking at here is the emissions, the annual emissions of the whole planet since 1750 in um, billion tons 
amount of uh, carbon dioxide emitted. And you can see it goes up really, really steeply since about 1900, basically the Industrial Revolution. So you've got this steep curve of, of accumulative emissions um, happening uh, across the globe. And we're emitting something like 35 to 40 billion tonnes of CO2 every year globally and you can see some of the key countries and, and regions that do that so there's and these are all measurements by the way this is not uh, stuff that people have thought up by any means uh, so you can see that there's a, a very steep increase a rapid increase in the the absolute emissions of uh, co2 when you put that into other greenhouse gas emissions so all the other things like methane that are also emitted that number of 35 billion goes up to something like 50 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year and the number's only going up as that curve would would indicate so we are clearly emitting more and more year on year. Where does that come from? Uh, well, there's a variety of sources, and this is one of many pictures you can find on, on the web that tell you what the sources are for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, just some key facts I wanted to pull out from that, that industry is about 30%. So that's the energy consumed in industry directly, whether it's um, electricity, gas, other fuel sources to, to create uh, the products that we need. Um, agriculture is significant at uh, a fifth of the uh, overall pie, uh, and then buildings themselves at just under 20%, and lastly, transport at about 16%. Uh, and that's not all of it, of course. So you can see there's a wide variety of that consumption of fuels that then lead to greenhouse gas emissions, but other sources as well, agricultural emissions, um, uh, biodegradation emissions, uh, chemical emissions from different processes as well. So there's a wide variety. And what this says to us is, is this, there's no one uh, silver bullet, there's no one solution to it all. Each sector has its own way of dealing with this, which is good because it gives us a variety of choices to, to actually implement a reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, all those increases in absolute carbon emissions going back in time um, and it, that, that previous graph I showed you where the emissions are going up, what does that mean to the Earth's atmosphere? Essentially, the in, there's been an increase in carbon dioxide concentration, and that's on that far right hand side of, of the graph here. So what you're looking at is the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. It's been fairly steady for about a million years, and then suddenly right at the end it ticks up and it's now at over 415, 416 parts per million in the atmosphere. So it's a tiny fraction of the Earth's atmosphere, but it's really important because it's what drives greenhouse gases. Just to put the perspective on that of when we appeared on the planet, so it's been fairly steady going up and down ice ages and warm periods, ice ages and warm periods, and then suddenly at the end it's gone up. And that's directly linked to the increase in CO2 that we're pumping out. That first slide I showed you a minute or two ago. How that then knocks onto temperature, so more carbon dioxide is emitted, that means there's more concentration in the atmosphere, which means we've got a, a thicker blanket uh, in the atmosphere, trapping the sun's heat in, temperature goes up effectively. And uh, I'm sure you're well aware that the Earth's temperature on average has gone up by over one degree Celsius uh, since about 1850. It's something like 1.1, 1.15 now. Um, on average, it's it, it's more extreme the further north and south you go, but on average, the temperature has gone up by just over a degree Celsius, which links into the whole idea of trying to limit that warming by no more than one and a half degrees Celsius. Um, and there's various different uh, ways of, of, of mapping that and different trajectories. So it all links more CO2 emitted, uh, more CO2 in the atmosphere as a concentration and the temperature goes up. And what that effectively means is there's, there's more energy trapped in the system. That energy has to go somewhere, whether that's as a wildfire following lots of drought, whether it's extreme rainfall and flooding, extreme temperatures in parts of the world that shouldn't have extreme temperatures, uh, coral bleaching, you can see all the effects on here and you know we've, we've all seen these in the news over the last few years. Um, they are getting more and more frequent and more and more extreme, which is essentially what climate change is doing. It's making the situation, the, the existing standard situation, worse and more frequent. So what are we actually doing about it? Um, the story goes back a long way. I'm sure you, uh, those of you who are old enough remember the Brundtland report that came out in 1987 defining what sustainable development is. That led on to Rio in 92, the Earth Summit, which, which and one of the outcomes of that was forming the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. That has then led to the Kyoto Protocol and the first big global uh, movement to do something actively about climate change specifically. And, that, and, and the period for that working was from 2005 to 2020, you know, getting things going. Paris is, is quoted quite frequently as one of the most outstanding conference of parties that happened in 2015, ratified in 2016. 
um, and really putting pressure on uh, governments and countries to do something actively about climate change. And obviously, in a couple of weeks' time, we're having COP26 uh, in Glasgow, and, and the eyes of the world are certainly on uh, on the UK, on Scotland. So, action is being taken, but possibly not quick enough, not effectively enough. In the UK, we've got the Climate Change Act, which has been around since 2008, updated in 2019. That's where we get the, the terminology of net zero from. We as a country have to be net zero on our territorial emissions by 2050. We've reduced a lot already. Um, that's what the thick black line is showing you on that graph from the Committee for Climate Change. We've reduced our emissions by about 40%, but we've got a long way to go. And it's going to get harder the further we go. We've, we've done some of the low hanging fruit already. But essentially, each sector has to do its bit. We have to go out and um, procure what we can and actively work towards um, uh, lower carbon solutions, lower carbon resources. And recently, um, kind of in April this year, March, April this time, a new piece of legislation came in to mandate uh, an intermediate target in 2035. So there's a there's a, a milestone on the route down to net zero. So we're one of the first countries in, in the world to actually have legislation on this. There are a few others, but in terms of major industrial nations, we're pretty much the first. So we've got active law about it and we're working on it. Bringing it closer to supply chain, one of the topics or the main topic of what we're talking about today, um, one of the many PPNs that have come out from the, uh, from the UK government recently, public procurement uh, policy notes, uh, was the one back in June, uh, 0621, June 21 which was talking about carbon reduction plans in uh, major spend from central government. And you can see the details there. So a couple of weeks ago, it came into force that any um, central government uh, procurement that's valued at £5 million or more per year has to have a carbon reduction plan in line with uh, net zero uh, targets for the UK. And that will flow down through the supply chain. So it's not just that, that uh, first level uh, contractor or supplier but it will flow down so there's there's more and more drivers coming forward for this um, from government and from policy and just put a couple of examples on the scale and the relevance of supply chain to this this is a piece of work that we as action sustainability did for an estates organization um, they'd already undertaken their own scope one and scope two uh, carbon assessment and just briefly scope one is the the stuff that you own and control um, so your your boilers your own vehicles things like that where you directly control the, the consumption of those fuels scope two is your electricity scope three is everything else it's all your supply chain and did the calculations for them and realized that scope three um, the supply chain is three quarters of their footprint so if they have an aspiration to become net zero um, to reduce their carbon as much as possible they really need to work alongside the supply chain and get their engagement and drilling into that further where did that scope three come from uh, the vast majority of that about two-thirds of it was from procurement and supply chain there's a big bit about commuting and travel, business travel, and some utilities as well. Uh, but the, the biggest chunk of that pie chart to go for was definitely in procurement. So that's clear evidence to say, if we're gonna go on a road to net zero, we need to be engaging with our supply chain. We need to think about how we procure the products and materials and the services and goods that we need to support us on that route down to net zero. Um, so supply chain and procurement definitely has the leverage. And obviously, there's lots of things we can do about it. As I was saying a minute ago, there's no one solution to this, which is which is kind of good. Um, we're not all clamoring after the same single technology. There's lots of different things out there, lots of different techniques we can uh, we can work towards. And here's just a few examples, a non-exhaustive list. But I've chosen the pictures on the right specifically because there's a lot of push towards electric vehicles, uh, lower energy um, products, electronic ways of doing things, moving away from paper-based products. Um, solar panels, obviously, all these kinds of things out there, these great technologies uh, can help us on that journey to carbon. But as we'll learn later this morning, it's not as simple as that. There are things bound up in that conversation. There's always, a, there's always an unintended consequence. So while these are great on uh, carbon and climate change, there's some other issues we need to think about. Uh, and that's where we'll bring Helen and Matt in in a little bit. But one point that I just want to uh, focus on for a minute is about the, the the leverage that procurement and supply chain has in this it really has a, a great opportunity to to um to drive that argument to drive that discussion about how can we reduce and bring our emissions down um and i think that's where i'm going to leave it because uh if i carry on i'm going to steal the thunder of the next speaker um so i'm going to pause there um and i'm I think we're going to move to your next mentee aren't we helen yes please if you can bring the mentee questions up thank I you will do.
Thank you. So that was a brief canter through climate change. Uh, we're going to move on to three more questions on Mentimeter. Um, I'll just push that on. So grab your phones again. If you're somehow logged out for some reason, go back to menti.com. Uh, the code is in the chat box somewhere. It's also on the screen, uh, 8616-6457. And I'll push the question on to the next one. Over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. So um, you can probably get, guess the theme of what I'm going to cover over the next 10 to 15 minutes, um, which is some of those unintended consequences. So we very quickly looked at carbon um, and, and we'll go in a, a little bit in, in a moment around um, James's messaging. But what I want to do is just gauge an understanding from you guys on whether you're thinking about human rights um, and whether you're thinking about the people aspects associated. So the first question is a uh, word cloud. So you get to get creative again. Um, what do you see as the biggest human rights which is associated with climate change? Um, so some of you have already put it. Thank you. So, yeah, resources is definitely going to be one of those. Um, so water scarcity. Um, uh, forced migration. Yeah, I've got some statistics on that later on um, in terms of how we're going to see people moving across the globe. Uh, vulnerability is going to be key. So you're picking up some of those aspects already in things like modern slavery, um, conflict, um, homelessness, yep, displacement. Um, gosh, you guys are thinking a lot on this one. Um, I'm pretty much capturing most of them. Starvation, yes, there was a statistic. Um, I think it was about two weeks ago that I saw in the newspaper a particular um, area in Africa where they reckon there's going to be uh, possibly up to two million people um, experiencing starvation um, on a massive scale due to the fact that they have no access to food, um, uh, the effect that the climate is having on their living arrangements. Um, waste disposal, cheap labour, yes, forcing us to go down that cheap labour route. Fuel poverty, um, yeah, we'll talk about just transition a little bit later on as well. So, yeah, James, if you can do the next one, please. Um, does your modern slavery policy um, or human rights um, talk about human rights issues in the supply chain beyond tier one? So do you have one? Um, yes, um, it's in development. No, don't have a policy. Haven't got a clue. Um, Hopefully I'm going to see a few more on the left hand side of the screen than on the right, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we if we did see quite a few on the right hand side. But I am pleasantly surprised. Yes. Um, human rights and supply chain beyond tier one. Good. You're all thinking um, about vulnerabilities in your supply chain, about the issues of exploitation in your supply chain. Um, and I'll summarise at the end of my bit uh, around due diligence and the sorts of things that you should be thinking about within that supply chain aspect. Um, really important. Um, for those of you in development, try and get to know who the 14 are on the left hand side. You might want to have a, a, have a word with them on what they're including and share some ideas, but some good ideas in there as well. OK, thanks, James, for the last question. OK, but here's one. What's your knowledge around products? So what products are you familiar with that have been linked to human rights abuses and modern slavery? So think about this from your procurement or your organisational standpoint. Is there anything that you're worried about within your supply chain? Um, or think about it personally. Um, think about the sorts of things that you're buying every day. Um, let's have a look at what sort of uh, knowledge we've got in there as well. Yeah, mining and minerals, stone and minerals. <laughs> um, the mining industry does get a bit of a, a lens looking at it. Uh, clothing, PPE was a very big hot topic, um, obviously during the coronavirus um, at its height, um, with the government being um, exposed for uh, buying gloves from a company called Top Glove who were using children in Malaysia. Um, and so a huge in those areas. Electronics, um, we'll talk a lot about those in a moment. Uh, palm oil, yeah, interestingly, palm oil, people think about palm oil from the perspective of deforestation, uh, but there's been some recent exposés on the use of exploited labour in the palm oil industry as well. So not just thinking about the environmental aspects, but some of you are already thinking about um, some of those other areas. Solar panels, yep, we'll talk about those in a moment. Polysilicon, which links into those. Fruit and veg, yep, this is my sound middle class. Um, avocados, <laughs> tomatoes, strawberries, um, actually most of your food supply chain, if it's international, has a potential risk. I'm a big coffee drinker, so that's obviously a big issue as well. Um, okay, you've, you've all got a very good awareness in terms of the things that you're thinking about, so thank you for that. Um, James, if I could now move to sharing my screen. Um, if you can bear with me. 
share. And if I can just have a thumbs up, if you can see that, okay. Matt, can you see that? Okay, well, thank you. So, okay, so you've been, so you've seen through some of those questions, um, the sort of next 10 or 15 minutes of what we're gonna cover. Um, and James has very eloquently talked to you already about the science -y bit. Sorry, James, that's not your question. The science -y bit of climate change, the impact from an environmental perspective. Um, only really seen, however, recently, much more of an intelligent conversation happening around climate change now, looking at the people aspect, starting to understand the unintended consequences, looking at the human rights aspects that are associated with the impact of climate change going forward. So it's important that as individuals and as organisations, we, we do what we and AS have been talking about for the last 15, 20 years, look at things more sustainably, look at things in a more um, connected lens rather than focusing just on climate change, just on what we need to be able to do. But think about the opportunities and risks associated with the people aspect too. Um, I'm gonna say something controversial now. Um, I don't actually believe this is about saving the planet. I'm not a planet saver. This is about saving the human race. Um, I have very interesting conversations with my dad over coffee. Um, and the reality is that the planet will be fine. It'll be different. It will change. It's lived for billions of years. Um, and fundamentally, if it's really annoyed with us, it kicks us off, tells us thank you very much. And we'll carry along with the merry way until eventually you can see the doomsday stories of a few billion years of the moon crashing in or disappearing. The planet itself will be fine. Um, what it will do is evolve and change. And if we want to still be part of that, we have to think about how climate change means we have to minimise that impact where we possibly can and actually start to look at what James has been talking about as well, that adaptation. Change is inevitable as a species, we experience it significantly. And we are now in probably one of the biggest periods of change we've ever had to deal with um, within our very short space of, of tenure on the planet. So it's important to understand that when we're thinking about the climate change aspect. It's not just about making the environment more habitable for us, but also understanding that actually, if we're going to go away and create a better environment for us to live in, doing that at the expense of human rights and doing that at the expense of people, it's completely missing the point. It's missing the point of what we're trying to do. So when we think about climate change, actually it's a human rights crisis as much of an as, as an environmental crisis. If we think about the things that you've identified within that word cloud, you know, um, people moving, lack of access to water, all those sorts of key things that we're starting to see regularly now um, as we have exposure to global news. Um, we understand that actually we have to start considering the vulnerabilities that are going to be happening through supply chains, through populations that we interact with on a daily basis. If we think about the fact that um, they predict in 2050, the global uh, GDP, if we hit that 3.2, will decrease by 18%. That's a significant um, decrease in global GDP. And we, as a human race, actually quantify how successful we are by our, our GDP. Um, if we think that at this current moment in time, we have 698, people living in, uh, 698 million people living in poverty, around about 10% of the world population, um, that GDP figure is going to be pushing vulnerabilities even further. And we're going to start to see even more poverty, even more people being displaced, people being pushed into that poverty trap who, who have been teetering on that edge over time. So understanding that climate change instills vulnerabilities and actually exploits those vulnerabilities and magnifies them is really, really important. When we think about how human rights um, are affected by climate change and how we start to think about the impacts. When I put, originally put this slide together, I put two things on there. The two main things I'm going to talk about are the results, as in, you know, what's happening globally, the environment in which we're living in, and obviously indirectly that's linked into things like, you know, the solar panels, the piling, the, 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 the batteries, you know, talking about flood bricks, those sorts of things. But I recently came across something that I'm actually experiencing personally as a parent as well which is actually how it's affecting future generations' mental health. Um, and there's something around about 40% of children that were interviewed in 10 countries are experiencing eco-anxiety. They're worrying about what's happening with their future, with the world that they're living in and how this is affecting them. So we're actually thinking about how we're affecting the next generation who are coming through as well to enable them to adapt, to live, to, to deal with these issues is really, really important. Um, so 
although we're thinking about the grown-ups and the effect that we're doing, that sort of mental health issue, the well-being issue that, that is genuinely affecting everybody in everybody's daily life is really, really important. So it's interesting to have a look at some of those. There's some really interesting statistics on how we can help our, our kids understand the impact of climate change and take control of their future um, so that they're more adaptable. The two main ways though that I'm going to speak to um, that really affect us from an organisational perspective but also will affect us in our daily lives look at the issues of human rights and migration of people access to resources so the impact that climate change has on our living environment and therefore affecting our ability to hit our basic Maslow needs if you remember the Maslow hierarchy of needs not being able to get the basics to be able to exist on a daily basis and then indirectly through that innovation which is really important we understand the procurement activities we need to do create that balanced lens. So if we take the first aspect and we think about human rights um, from, a, from a perspective of how climate change is impacting them, uh, this is a great diagram that shows you exactly how as individuals we're affected right now by the impact of climate change. If we think in your little um, word cloud that you created, you found some of them already in there, so water scarcity, um, drought, so if you're thinking about things like strawberries, for example, where they come from in, in Spain, um, they're currently growing them in areas where there are water shortages and using water from drinking um, um, environments uh, for local people to create strawberries that are then sold out. So water shortages, water scarcity is, is a big issue. Um, you've seen on James's pictures the heat waves, the floods, um, and we talked already about the fact that we're seeing mass migration. So over the last 10 years, we've seen something like 40.5 million people being displaced due to these extreme weather events. Um, they're, they're moving away from their homes, sometimes in the same country, but actually always then being, a, but then a large majority of them being able to travel to um, other countries to find places to live and meet their basic needs. It's predicted that by 2050, if we carry on the way we are, that, that could be up to 200 million people that are being displaced from their homes. So in terms of mass migration, immigration, all those sorts of issues, they are going to to become more and more and more prevalent. So as, a, and as countries, if we're thinking we're all right, and we've solved our own problems, that makes us more attractive to individuals who basically want them basic needs met. Um, so understanding that migration, understanding how we can help other countries deal with their issues is also really, really important. What all that does though, if you can't get access to your basic, if, um, you're being displaced, you can't get access to your basic information, your basic um, needs, sorry, is it creates a vulnerability. So we're seeing at the moment in the UK, you know, lots and lots and lots, depending on what you read the Daily Mail or the Guardian, lots of stories about, you know, immigration coming into the UK. It's not necessarily modern slavery. It's not necessarily human traffic. It might be smuggling, which means that they're paying for people to bring them into the country and then are free to be able to move about. But they're coming to countries that they don't understand, that they don't know the rules. They're here illegally. That creates a huge amount of vulnerability, which pushes people then into that area of modern slavery, exploitation, all the sorts of issues that we want to try and avoid over time. So it's important um, that we, we understand that even though climate change is an environmental thing, the impact on the human species is significant and vulnerability is definitely at the heart of what this is creating and leaving more and more people at the, ex at the expense of the people who are going to exploit them. So it's important that we understand that we have to be able to deal with these issues. And whilst you also think about the fact that we're talking around, you know, when we talk about the narrative of climate change, we talk about vulnerabilities, and I see this a lot in modern slavery work I do in human and human rights, everyone jumps to the Africans in the world, they, they jump to China, they jump to Uzbekistan or, or, or you know, Afghanistan as we currently think. But the 10 countries that have had the biggest impact since 1999 up to 2019, had the biggest disruption due to climate change included in there with Germany. Um, interestingly, okay, seven of those 10 are what we call low development countries, but three of them are countries that are significantly intelligent, sophisticated, have invested a lot of money in their infrastructure. Um, we need to think about those. Um, give me two seconds. I've just somebody saying they can't hear me very well, so I'm going to change my microphone. Um, I'm going to go into Kelly Thomas if you can stay with me.
There we are. I've now joined a call centre. Can you hear me well? <laughs> Brilliant. OK. Um, thank you. Um, so in terms of the climate change, the vulnerabilities is really key. And then obviously, as we're starting to get into the issue of on slavery and exploitation, we are going to see a huge increase of issues like that as vulnerabilities increase. Um, thanks, guys. Um, so if we move on to some examples of where we're starting to see this and real case studies, um, one of the ones that if you've ever been on new my training courses, you've heard me talk an awful lot about is blood bricks. Um, so this is a potential area where um, in Cambodia and South Asia, we were starting to see an increase in debt bondage and individuals ending up working in kilns, providing bricks for the massive growth of um, construction that was going on within the area. And the reason this debt bondage was actually happening was mainly due to the fact that it was farmers who were unable to actually um, grow any crops due to the effects of climate change or the environment in which they were operating in. They were running into significant debt, um, and as part of that significant debt, they weren't able to, um, to carry on working, and that debt was bought by kiln owners. Now, these kiln owners um, own that debt on behalf of the people that work for them. Um, they then obviously are not particularly that bothered about health and safety. They're not particularly bothered about the well-being. So they have a significant number of individuals who work for them who, who experience um, alcoholism, depression, lots of illnesses due to toxic emissions that are coming out of the kiln process. Um, and fundamentally, their basic human rights are significantly impacted in working for these kilns. And what makes this particularly um, bad is the fact that whilst we see a lot in, say, the UK, where we see debt bondage happening, um, if somebody disappears, the debt sort of disappears with them. In this particular instance, if an individual dies, um, their child picks up the debt, so it passes on to the family um, until eventually there may be no family left. Um, the reality as well within this situation is that whilst I do a lot of conversations around blood breaks and talk about the issues such as waste, um, as you can see here, issues around um, MNSs is actually, um, MNS and Primark that were um, having manufacturing facilities and their waste was being used to um, fuel the kilns. Um, what we start to understand is that Cambodia actually saw a 300% increase in exports into the UK over the last four or five years. So whilst we tend to think, okay, that's over there, and some people will go, that's their problem, we're not buying from them. When we get to situations like where we are now, which is where you're where the materials are coming from, we start to make decisions that may not consider human rights as, as important as I just need to get. So I need to get my bricks, I need to get my steel, I need to get everything now to keep my projects running. And we may bypass that ethical consideration to go to places that don't have necessarily the best labour standards and endorse things like exploitation and modern slavery. The other issue as well is starting to think about um, that was a direct result of climate change and the impact it ends up causing people to find that vulnerability. But actually, there's the other side of it as well, where we are starting to look at significant technology advance now. We're looking at the solution to our world, ironically, as being computer driven, as chip driven, as you know, en energy technology, innovation, all really exciting. And I know we get really um, enthralled with the new innovations, the new ways that we can do things. But what we still have to consider is that when we're purchasing and procuring a lot of the items that we're buying, even if it's for a, a, a just reason like reducing our climate change impact, we have to understand that there might be some issues with human rights associated with it. So here's a great example, a, a great quote. Um, companies who overlook human rights concerns as they clean up their energy sources are presenting their customers with false choice, people or planet. It's just flawed. Um, it isn't one or the other. We have to have that connected and cohesive approach to this. And a great way of, of talking about that is pardon the pun, but the hot topic right now, um, the solar panels um, with the Uyghurs. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Uyghurs um, in China, you're probably all familiar with them. They're the forced labor camps um, in China where they keep um, a lot of the um, religious minorities in and force them to work. They are currently producing something like a third of the, uh, the global polysilicon that goes into solar panels. And China currently produces around 80% of the world's um, requirements. So it's a significant impact. Uh, these are significantly bad um, labour camps. And I know um, Matt will probably talk to you a little bit about them a little bit later on. 
and obviously has meant that a lot of people now started to think about what do I do with my solar panels? It's not just about buying solar panels, it's about understanding can I get them in places where the human rights issues are being addressed. Um, so these are just some pictures that you can see um, of the, the conditions and the areas in which they're operating in. Um, but we have the same, it's not just solar panels, we also have the same with batteries, so car batteries, um, smartphones, um, a lot of the technology and computing that's going to be our way out of this by being more efficient has significant issues with child labour. So again, if any of you have been on my modern slavery and, and training courses, you'll hear me talking about conflict minerals um, around the use of a lot of technology um, companies using child labour um, in the production of the, the tech that's going in. And interestingly, there is currently a lawsuit, which I think will go on for quite a few decades, if I'm brutally cynical about this, um, that looks at um, suing the likes of Apple, Dell, Tesla, all these big innovation companies by families who've lost their children as part of the supply chain in creating those minerals. So we're starting to see the emphasis now on NGOs and the, the, the legal team started to think about actually can we start to make these companies accountable for the human rights breaches even if they're going off and doing something really wonderful like dealing with climate change they can't do it at the expense of our family um, and that's the way that they're looking at these issues. The other interesting one that I'm doing at the moment um, is to start thinking holistically as well about the impact on how we start to move away from certain fields of trade. So this is where we can maybe turn it into something a little bit more positive, I can always say. Um, something where we actually see this as an opportunity. So as we start to demonize and have done for quite a long time, things like the old traditional oil industries, coal industries, we start to say that they're bad environmentally and we want them all closing down. There's not many left anyway in the UK. Um, we've got an issue with regards to um, unemployment. So as we start to move, um, just traditional industries that have looked at sort of our power generation, for example, we can't just suddenly say we switch it all off. Um, we turn around and think about just closing them all down. There's a significant impact on unemployment that we need to be aware of and actually start to think about how we look at new skills, new opportunities in this space. So as you can see from this example, you know, if we look at the mining um, industry, we can see a massive impact in terms of high unemployment, low skills, um, massive uh, drain on the benefit system that we need to be thinking about, but actually thinking more strategically about how we move from one old skill to another, looking at investing in new skills is a really important opportunity. And that's part of something called Just Transition, um, which I'll, I'll show you in a second, um, which was basically the OECD's approach to how we move to net zero in a way that keeps people part of that dialogue, making sure that we enjoy new skills, that we enjoy people's access to um, new energy in a fair and equitable manner and again that's really important um, creating all these brilliant new in innovations that no one can afford if you're in a poverty trap is not a just transition um, it means that we're going to lose people along the way really good example of this um, the zero carbon hub um, zero carbon humber um, who are looking to actually create the world's first net zero industrial cluster by 2040 um, and that is all about upskilling um, and moving to new technologies looking at ensuring that obviously people have got new employment. Um, and there's something around about 55,000 jobs are being kept, another 49,000 jobs are being created, and also ensuring then that you're looking at apprenticeships and, and development and skills going forward. So from a human rights perspective, it isn't just that international space, but it's also thinking about the fact that we need to bring people along um, as part of that conversation. So when you're looking at this, the way to consider it, and I'll give you three, the three help topics and I'll pass over to, to Matt, um, is to make sure that when you're putting your organisational strategy, so you all talked about you've got a carbon strategy, some of you talked about modern slavery strategy, is that you are balancing that climate and people issue, that you are considering both of those issues. Um, so a great example of this is the Just Transition from SSSE. Um, go and have a look at that and actually OECD um, have also put a Just Transition uh, report out and this is about making people heart of what you are doing, uh, at the heart of what you're doing, um, so that it is still the net zero, you're still going for where you want, but people are the core um, in terms of how you're going to uh, adapt to those issues. The other thing as well is about ensuring um, that you have got due diligence processes in place, so as a procurement professional, um, you know, this is 
what I love. Uh, this is the bit about making sure your supply chain is ready. Um, and one of the things I do suggest when you are thinking about exploitation and you're thinking about that more international human rights is don't panic. Um, don't think you have to solve everything straight away. The due diligence processes you need in, play, in place need to involve stakeholders. It's a long journey to take ahead, but you need to be thinking about gathering your intelligence, understanding what's going on, talking to various different stakeholders in those spaces, identifying the risks and undertaking your risk assessment process is really important. And then slowly starting to ask questions of the supply chain. What we're looking for in terms of addressing people issues is ensuring that you are compliant. So you're not just looking at compliance, you're actually looking for real change over time. So avoid the tick box, have the dialogue, have the conversation. So the two key things and two pieces of advice I'd give you um, is look for intelligence. Um, get as much information as you can it's actually not as hard as you think just open your eyes and read um there are so many reports so many things you can go and find out go and talk to your um your clients and talk to your supply chain seriously you can't pick up a newspaper now without reading some sort of report about something around human rights so use that intelligence just to start the conversation to understand what's going on and then in a perfect handover to Matt, because I know what he's going to talk about, the key is then collaboration. You aren't going to do this yourself. You need to collaborate nicely with as many people as you possibly can. Um, and that means sometimes collaborating with your peers, collaborating with your competitors. Um, but this is the space in human rights that it's not a competitive advantage. It's just doing the right thing. I'm going to hand over now to Matt, who's going to talk about his aspects of sharing my screen, and we'll pick up some questions. Apologies for the mic issue, hopefully you can all hear me now, uh, but I'm going to pass over to Matt. Just, my screen. just quickly, thank you very much, Helen. Just to remind you uh, in the audience, if you do have any questions, do post them into the Q&A or the chat box and we'll pick those up later. Um, and yeah, so over to Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. How's that? Can you see that's that? That's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. great. Right. Let's put it on the slide show and then we're good to go. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Nice one. Perfect. Well, there's a there was a stunted, a stunted introduction. If there ever was one. Well, let's um skip on that. So yeah, just very briefly, yeah. Uh so Matt Galvin, uh, I work on responsible procurement uh, for TFL and actually our team, I sit in a team that's funded by the mayor's office. Uh, to implement his responsible procurement policy across the GLA group. So those functional bodies being Transport for London, uh, GLA, the uh, London Legacy Development Corporation, and the Met Police and the Fire Brigade. So there we go. So for those of you not aware of TFL, just a quick one through. Uh, we are the public authority on transport for, for London, and our reach is pretty broad. Um, 9,000 buses, 500 of those which were electric. Uh, we also have 15 different tube lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, buses, tubes, London Overground, uh, yeah, uh, cable car, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But quite importantly, our, our pre-COVID um, spend, uh, procurement spend, was 6.7 billion. So, a fairly significant amount of spend on goods, services, and works across Transport for London. And we generally spend that with our. Um, uh, it's about 4.5 billion of that 6.7 billion. Is with our key suppliers and we have around around 60 of those so that's just a quick introduction into tfl um and just briefly touching on the response procurement policy as i mentioned i sit in a uh, pan GLA group response procurement team um we have five themes and really the, i guess from the you know as you picked up the, the the focus of uh today's seminar is really around uh themes four and five and how they link together um around promoting ethical source practices or modern slavery human rights within the supply chain and improving environmental sustainability so i'm, I'm not going to dwell on that i just thought i'd give you a quick overview in terms of the kind of context of, of where we're coming from here so i'm just going to do a, a quick run through into the sort of timeline of tfl's interest in modern slavery and as you can expect from tfl has been a fairly progressive public sector organization kind of being committed to eradicating modern slavery from our organization and our supply chain for a number of years and this goes back to London Underground uh, being the first public body to join the, uh, the ETI kind of about 14 years ago and then more recently we've had a number of uh, activity and number of interventions into uh, those contracts and those uh, categories with inherent risks of human rights 
So I guess the, the key one was a TFO uniform contract uh, back in 2015, where we included requirements around the ETI base code, um, also requirement to undertake annual social accountability audits, as well as capability building. Um, in, in our uniform contracts, that's for uh, sort of 13,000 staff across the TFO network, um, circa 1.5 two million pounds uh, per year. Um, we've also touched on in this present in this presentation from um, from James and Helen earlier around the risks within the electronics industry, and we partnered with Electronics Watch back in 2016 to address the root cause of um, human rights issues in that um, sector. And I'll, I'll I'll touch on that later on uh, this morning. Um, yeah. Demonstrating our commitment to modern slavery, TFR has published a modern slavery statement each year since um, 2017, 2016 17, uh, following the act coming into effect in uh, 2015, which really sort of demonstrated our commitment in this area. We, we weren't required to provide a, a statement, but we have done because we thought it was the right thing to do. And that statement really just kind of shares our approach and our due diligence around human rights within the supply chain, but also sets goals for next year. Um, yeah, and then really in the last couple of years, I, I think we've been really, um, you know, using that using that procurement leverage, I guess, on the market to include both tender and contract requirements in those categories. Um, kind of starting out, you know, obviously with uniforms, but also in facilities management, ICT, and then more recently in some of our infrastructure uh, construction contracts and and rail. Um, and then in the last kind of 18 months or so, and despite the disruptions, uh, we've actually been working fairly closely uh, with Helen uh, and we've developed a uh, new approach to, uh, I guess, assurance within, um, within our supply chain, modern slavery. Um, and also Helen provided, um, we've done a number of training sessions. Um, and, and I think what we're really key on in, in TFL is to improve what we can do around our commercial process, but also ensure that those guys and girls who work on our projects and who are out and about on our on our network are aware of the signs of modern slavery so we've done some awareness raising sessions as well yeah so just going on to uh, a number of a number of case studies so as i mentioned the tier for uniforms contract um which was let back in 2015-16 we really because this is the first time that we included requirements around human rights we really focused on the ETI base code and the nine principles within that as a kind of that really is the minimum standard of labor rights and um, working conditions so that was a requirement as the as part of the tender stage suppliers were asked to or bidders were asked to set out in terms of how they would comply not just themselves but their supply chains with the base code and then we also included um, social accountability audits against using the base code as the criteria um, year on year so it's been it's been a really uh, a really big uh, learning curve for us within tfl but also um, um, with our with our supply chain partners so we um, it's a fairly short supply chain so we supply uh, or supply via uh, our supplies base within the uk and then they source um, from uh, two factories in Bangladesh and, and one in China. And um, I think we're really aware of um, some of the limitations of social accountability audits. So although we have those audits and we can get access to those audits and how they're doing and the non-conformances and et cetera, et cetera, via SEDEX, the Supplier Ethical Data Exchange. We also include some requirements around um, capability building um just to see if we could just try and improve those labor rights um for those mostly ladies certainly working in uh, bangladesh so they've undertaken um, some training you can see some evidence there around training around health and safety training around um bangladeshi lo local labor law they've also implemented a grievance procedure as well so so it, it really has improved the the rights and the, I guess, the working conditions of those on the ground. So that's been um, quite quite a success for us. Um, um, but again, that's been a fairly short uh, supply chain. So touching on to electronics, electronics and the electronics industry, and I'm sure we're all aware of 
numerous human rights violations associated with the global electronics um, industry. Uh, and, and I think really for Transport for London, we were aware of these risks for some time, but kind of struggled with the fact that uh, we didn't really have any, any purchasing power against you know, the, the global brands, uh, such as you know, Dell, HP, Apple, Lenovo, et cetera, et cetera. So we joined Electronics Watch, um, which is really an organization that allows public bodies to leverage their purchasing power together to then have a consistent approach when going to the market. And it's all driven by this um, worker-driven monitoring. Um, so there, there, there are a number of, uh, shall we say, civil society organizations, trade unions, employees on, on, on the ground who really understand and really know those issues of those factories. So how, how it works is there are contractual, contractual uh, requirements which require the resellers or the brands to disclose their factory locations of their most popular um, products uh, on, on the contract. That's then shared with, with Electronics Watch, who then share that with their civil society or organizations. And then they report back in terms of, okay, so what are the key systemic issues of um, human rights violations or, or working conditions on the ground. And the idea is that then Electronics Watch work with the industry, with the RBA as well, with the supplier to really try and address those root cause of those issues. Um, it's not a quick fix. It's certainly a kind of medium to long-term approach, um, but it's something that we, we, we think is the right thing to do is to really try and address those issues in the medium to long-term um and 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 we've included those requirements in a number of our key contracts itd hardware some of our some of our radio contracts and also our oyster cards yeah so so moving forward excuse me and the um just touching on the response procurement implementation plan so um each mayoral term we have an implementation plan which really sets out how we're going to implement the response procurement policy over the um, uh, over the uh, mayoral term, and I've just picked out the some of the key um, commitments around human rights, which we touch on this on this issue of human rights and climate change. For you, we have a number of other uh, requirements around other areas of modern slavery, but really touching on those uh, those those two key issues there. And I think the key key phrases to kind of pick out there are collaborate with partner organizations you know this is the, this is something that we can't do on our own it's really complex especially when you start to get into these complex supply chains and so we need to work with, with other people with experts with other partners to improve that supply chain transparency so i'm just going to take you through uh the the sort of challenge we have around electric vehicles and i know both um james and helen touched on these earlier this morning. So I think I think we're all pretty aware that really, you know, the demand for electric vehicles and, and, and you know lithium ion batteries is expected to grow kind of exponentially. It looks like compared to that graph, it looks like you know tenfold within the next 10 years as we sort of transition to that you know zero carbon uh, vehicles. And and I guess the question is, well, why is that? Well, well, all those those electric vehicles and those other products, those other solutions that are kind of part of our part of our society, environmental and social economic impacts related to the mining and manufacturing of these materials and these minerals. And I think people on the call are all aware of this has come up from the uh, the word cloud earlier. Um, it's generally a problem in the global south um so you've got reference there to uh um you know chile are really the people of, of chile are really pushing back on water of the world's uh, lithium deposits and that, that that's from the kind of atacama salt flats um we've got um lithium ion batteries around you know in the within, within the drc but closer to home there you know serbia and issues with a Rio Tinto's work there, so it is it is a, 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 a global problem, and I think the fact that this information is now available to us, then we need to use that information and make those informed decisions when we are making those procurement decisions. Yeah, so we're 
we're, we're kind of at that point whereby um, you know it's really clear that mining and the manufacturing of batteries and the manufacturing of semiconductors has these really negative impacts of use of toxic chemicals there's really really bad issues in terms of occupational health and safety uh, within the electronics industry we've got fairly uh, widespread environmental harm forced labor labor rights violations etc etc um, so you know we you know we really need to ensure that when we are making those decisions as i said previously you know we, we really need to see you know what we can do around supply chain uh, transparency so something that um, we're linking in with uh, Electronics Watch is that they have um, uh, recently developed a proposal to extend their current model of what they're doing within the ICT hardware sector into the into the automotive se sector. And why is that? Well, there's a, you know there is a real a real push for um, central government departments, public bodies, lo local bodies to really start rolling out that transition to electric vehicles to improve obviously not the climate agenda but also the local air quality agenda as well and as you can see there there's a you know a growing demand of 30 million electric vehicles by 2030 and also 1.2 million e-buses and service within the next th three or four years now the key thing to that is electronics is actually essential to the success of these strategies with almost half of costs of new vehicles being electronics. Um, electronics Watch have done a fair bit of research in this area and have um, identified that there's a fairly undeveloped supply chain due, due diligence processes in the automotive sector. Um, and, that, and actually out of all, and I've, I've got some information I can kind of share around, but um, out of most kind of uh, standard sectors and categories of spend, they have um, probably the worst record on corporate human rights. So there's a real need there to really work together collaboratively, not just public buyers and unions, but, but the industry and the pressure groups to all work together to see what they can do in this area. And certainly there's an opportunity there around uh, whether you're a public buyer or a private buyer, but it's really opportunity to, um, you know, really try and transform what we're doing in this area to really improve the supply chain transparency, maybe take some of the lessons learned from some of the other sectors into this sector. Um, but it really is all around um, collaboration. Okay, just touching on another um, another contract which I'm currently supporting and TFL are currently supporting. So the so TFL actually undertake uh, the procurement for the mayor's office and the GLA. So this retrofit accelerator for for homes um, is a mayoral project, and as you can see there, the intention is to ensure that those that these um, domestic homes are well insulated and have um, solar panels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so that they become self reliant in terms of energy. So they really really reduce their energy costs. So the, the idea is that you're, you're going from um, house on the left to house on the right yeah now that is sounds fantastic as we said it's a really it's a great solution in terms of some of the, the challenges we have not only around climate change but fuel poverty as well um, but again with a lot of our modern day solutions there are also unintended uh, consequences and i know helen's already touched on this around the plight of the Uyghur muslims um, certainly, in uh, it's been well documented in this uh, report in, in broad daylight. So I suggest you have a look at that if, if you're looking to go down the route of solar panels, or if you're involved in that in that sector. Um, and and we've um, just started the conversation really with those suppliers on that framework for the retrofit accelerator. So we've currently we've um, we've. Uh, had some requirements around ethical sourcing um, to get them onto the framework and other on the framework and now this is this is, has, has come to light um, around uh, you know like polysilicon and some of the challenges there within the supply chain so we're, we're, we're currently engaging with, with, with those suppliers um, to, to see what we can do and I think the approach to take is we haven't got all the solutions at the moment but it's just literally Let's have a conversation. Let's try and identify some solutions. What can we do to mitigate those risks? And actually, um, I'm going to be part of a roundtable that, that that Helen is pulling together 
with the, uh, the, the Solar Trader Association and some other public buyers to see what we can do. So that's, um, that's everything uh, from me this morning. I hope that was uh, of interest and use and yeah, just happy to be part of any uh, Q&A. It's really good. Thank you, Matt. That was really interesting hearing some of those case studies about how it's happening in reality. Uh, Helen and I could talk about this all day, but hearing hearing how it's actually happening on the ground is really useful. Um, as I say, if you do have any questions from the audience, do pop them in the chat box and we'll pick those up. I've got a few already, so I'm just kind of navigating my way around all the different screens we've got here. Um, I just push those up there. Um, I've got a first question that I'm going to come to Helen with. Um, and then I'll come to yourself, Matt, as well, with the same question, basically. Who do you think has got the most influence in this space that we've been talking about this morning? And likewise, who else do we need to involve in it? I'm not on mute, am I? Good, that's a good no, start. You're, you're not mute. Um, <laughs> um, okay, influence. Ultimately, the, the, the main success of this is clients, um, because this is gonna make some really hard decisions. So if I think about construction as an industry, um, you know, if the client wants it to happen, it happens. Um, so understanding how we can get into that world um, and drive it into the supply chain, drive that transparency, ultimately comes from the client. Um, however, it, it doesn't mean that if a client doesn't want it, it, does, it can't happen. Um, I think the key for me in terms of engagement is where the leverage sits in terms of the processes that you operate in. So actually, even if you're at level two of a supply chain, you still have influence, you still have opportunities to identify, understanding where your leverage sits um, by going out and understanding the market, what can you take, what can you understand, what, what's available for you, and then understanding areas like Matt's already intimated, the collaboration space, what can you do? So there's influence at different pockets, a client ultimately, but within the supply chain there's influence because you are asking for things, so you can, you can go away and get those within yours. Uh, the government obviously has a lot of influence, but it's not just down to them to do. Um, that, that is uh, an important part, but it isn't just down to them to do. I think business has a huge amount, amount to play. Um, so everyone has a different opportunity. I mean, if you're, if you're further down in a tier three or a four and you're thinking, what the heck, I can't do this. I can't understand and go and talk to somewhere in China. That's not, that's not where your influence lies. Your influence lies by getting the data, understanding what's going on and being able to publish pepper that back up the supply chain to help with those decisions later on so influences are different depending on where you sit everybody has influence but ultimately if it's going to have to get paid for the client is the ultimate the purse holder if that makes sense thanks helen should we go to the client then to matt um <laughs> who's going to say no helen, <laughs> any, any, any development on that from your from your experience on that kind of those different kinds of influence different levels of influence that uh actors up and down the value chain have yeah, no, uh, yeah, uh, I'd agree with Helen. Really, you know, you know, the the client has the has that influence because we can require, you know, you know, certain supply chain transparency and certain standards within the supply chain. Um, but we need, I think, the you know, it's, you can only really require those certain standards, etc., if they're in that industry, and if they're achievable, you know, they have to be smart. So I, th I think there's there's probably a a link between the client wanting to require certain standards and rules and regulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but then th there kind of needs to be that um, uh, activity within within the sector, and that activity could be influenced by by the government. Um, you know, really trying to influence these 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 sectors. You know, so um, yeah. But then it's it's not just our government, is it? It's the kind of yeah. the global governments and the global shift and industry and the industry really taking a hold of it, you know. Um, so and ironically, if you actually look, um, I think I this shows you how sad I am. I actually read China's Human Rights Action Plan um, last week because um, they've just issued it. Um, and if you actually read what it's got in there, there is a whole bit on religious freedoms and the ability to practice whatever religion you want. So, you know, governments have a role to play, but they all do a lot of talking and usually not necessarily backed up by the evidence. Because if you read their action plan, the weekly camp shouldn't exist. Um, they, yeah. they, they should be OK. So I don't think we can rely on governments. Um, I, I think we have to take personal responsibility. No, no that, that's, that's true. You know, going with your eyes open, don't. 
believe everything you read. And following on from that, there's obviously the influential piece, but then there's also a skill set. So when we know that we've influenced the right people and we want to do certain things, uh, quite often uh, in many of the sectors that we engage with, there's a skills gap. So uh, Matt, if you want to pick that one up first, please, what kind of skills do you see need to be generated or developed further in in, in the, the, the people and the organisations that are going to have to try and tackle some of the stuff we talked about this morning. Yeah, sure. Thanks, James. Um, I th well, I think that wh where there's been a kind of a steep rise in uh, capability and skills and expertise around, you know, carbon and climate change within the last kind of 10, 15 years, certainly the last five years, it's kind of shifted right over into carbon, carbon reduction. I think we kind of need that in more than slavery as well, don't we, really? So it's around due diligence processes, it's around data gathering, it's around audit and assurance and verification. So it's all that, all that kind of wider piece, which I, can, I, I guess kind of all sits under that supply chain transparency. So, you know, the, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Super. Helen, do you want to build on that at all? I'm going to be a bit controversial here and actually say sustainability. The biggest challenge we have is that people are picking silos of sustainability and going with them without understanding the interconnectivity between all those different aspects. So I still think sustainability is not really understood yet. Um, and I think it's not understood enough yet in terms of how it's so, how it's a backbone of an organization. So everything we're talking about in terms of transparency, um, and I can see Carl's on, Carl's on the call, um, you know, sips talk about the same thing. You know, it's, it's fundamentally about, I need to understand my supply chain to become more resilient, to understand how to be more flexible, to understand right now how the hell I'm going to get my stuff. Um, and these are all key bits to sustainability. So I, I think what we need is we've got lots of specialists, but there's no, we need a way to be able to bring them all together. And sustainability is actually that way of bringing it holistically all together to have that more balanced approach. Um, I personally think that that is and in terms of how it then influences business strategy, because if business moves in a way that says I'm going to be more responsible and more sustainable, then lots of these decisions tend to flow a little easier, um, personally. So it's joining up the dots in some respects from what I'm hearing is, yeah, this, the, there's all these different sustainability impacts, whether you call it carbon or social value or waste or circular economy, lots of great buzzwords, but how those all link together and how they all impact on each other. No, no, that's really useful. Thank you. I suppose taking a step back for me, there's the uh, there's a legislative point. We know there's the Modern Slavery Act has been out for six years now is it 2015 yeah uh, and, and various other versions of that elsewhere in the world but you know taking that legislation and policy approach is there is there a role for greater policy and legislation or a strengthening of what we have you know what, what do you see is that that approach um helen if i come to you first in terms of what else we might need in that space or do we even need anything have we got all the tools we need from a policy point of view i personally hate legislation um, and I do think that it that it that the, what the modern slavery one thing the modern slavery has been successful in doing is starting the conversation. But if you understand the legislation from a business perspective, it's shocking how few are actually complying with it because it is so simple to comply with. You literally produce a statement. Um, so I think from the perspective of legislation, I I'm much more of an advocate of you know give the the travel of uh, the trajectory and travel but then let organisations pick it up and run with it. Unfortunately, they haven't done that with modern slavery, but I think that's because they're still trying to get their heads around it. Um, you could go down the legislation route in terms of making it tougher, but it's, just to give you an idea, I was training a couple of weeks ago, um, some Europeans, Russians, Azerbaijan, um, Uzbekistan, and the narrative is different around this. So you can't even get the same narrative around modern slavery. You don't mention modern slavery, you mention human trafficking. You go to China, you don't mention human trafficking, you don't mention um, modern slavery, you mention um, labour standards. So there's no international connectivity on in that. So I think legislation is good in terms of creating that conversation, but it's just too difficult to legislate um, in the world that we live in right now. And I think it would be too difficult to do that from a business perspective. Um, we do need to maybe make it a bit tighter for organisations to just do their statements. <laughs> and I'm quite happy to legislate heavier for that. I'm quite happy that we should find companies for doing that. Australia have done it. Um, and I think the European Union will do the same thing. The due diligence legislation also is another one that's coming in that is going to make a very interesting landscape with the opportunity for compensation. We're seeing that happen a lot more 
that's going to be the teeth, the teeth I think, more than necessarily on slavery legislation that's going to get businesses finally sitting up and taking them, um, finally taking notice because fundamentally they may be financially accountable for some of those issues coming through. Um, so yeah, I, I don't always say advocate great more legislation because it doesn't always do what you want it to do. Okay, thanks, Anna. And, and kind of extending that, Matt, it's it sounds like it's a language thing, it's a communication thing as well. So there's you can you can write lots of pieces of legislation and put them into into place, but. Uh, there's something about the language that's used and that's very cultural as well. Is that something that you see going on about how you have to, you have the same, you're trying to have the same conversation, but you're having to phrase it differently, putting it in different ways, depending on the stakeholders you're talking with or TFL is talking with? Um, yeah, I think, I think certainly when I've had conversations with people around Monsavia, I have to really kind of, for the first time, sometimes I have to really kind of explain it in terms of, what it is and what is the risk to them mm -hmm. and what could be the risk within the supply chain so um yeah you know there, there is a bit of kind of framing it um as i'm speaking to other people from you know across our business and some of our suppliers to that extent as well there's been we've done a bit of education uh, with our suppliers um but yeah i mean I, th I think going back to the legislation piece i yeah, I kind of agree. I kind of agree with Helen, but but I think also I think also we found it. It's really given us the. We're talking about the um, modern slavery act here. It's really given um, a focus for us for ourselves and our organisation. You know, our our statement goes goes up to the TFL board. People are much more aware of the risk within our supply chain. Our suppliers, some of our suppliers, are doing a lot of due diligence on modern slavery. Some of our suppliers. Even though they have risks, they need to maybe um, kind of improve what they're doing. And I think we, I kind of would expect to the strengthening of the legislation by now. Um, I know the government did consultation uh, about 18 months, uh, two years ago. But I think we really, I think we will get, we've had a step change, we've had the conversation. I think we'll get another step change if they strengthen the legislation. Um, so it, re it required them to do a statement, but also followed up and had some, had a bit more teeth in the act. To really push them forward, because I think some businesses just see it as a bit of a, a bit of a tick box, which is which is unfortunate. But it'd be it'd be great to that that due diligence piece come in, because then then I think you will really see a step change for organisations, um, even ones like ourselves, to re to really um, embed this across all its operations and its functions. Yeah, no, that's really useful. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we've got a, a, a comment from Paul on the Q and A about taking a step back from all that high-tech stuff we've been talking about today whether it's solar panels or lithium batteries where there are as we've been discussing you know issues of Uyghur Muslims in in, in China um, issues in in the DRC taking it back to the root cause of climate change and that's digging up dead dinosaurs basically and then burning them um, he makes a point here about the Alberta tar sands in Canada the Niger Delta um, in in Western Africa and sometimes environmental problems there that are inherently linked with child labor and poor labor standards um, and this goes back a long way this is a, not a recent thing uh, so it's it's to that wider point as well that this is not this is not a point about trying to save ourselves or save the, the planet from climate change it's it's the opposite way around but it brings along with it similar labour standard issues or labour issues. Uh, Helen, I don't want to reflect on, on that at all. Yes, um, no, I, I, I think you're right. The, the issues, I mean, a lot of the conversations that I have with a lot of people can get a little bit t tasty because we do talk um, about population issues and consumption issues um, and the fact that fundamentally we are in a position where right now we need to look at what we are consuming, how we're living. Some of it isn't about creating new technology, it's about thinking about how we do better with what we've got. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, when it comes to child labour, you know, the, there is a, a real balance. Um, and in fact, if you speak to Alex from Nottingham University, oh, sorry, University of Nottingham, not the other one, um, you know, he talks about the fact that we talk about cotton, for example, being an industry where, um, you know, the government, um, Uzbekistan government actually forced their people to go and work in cotton fields to produce cotton. Um, and we sit here and think that's horrendous, but actually in those countries, they, it's, it's work, it's normal what they do. They're quite happy with that, they've got money coming in. So the dialogue when it comes to child labour, to, to 
um, understanding some of those supply chains, I think, is quite complex. It's not as straightforward as it used to be. Um, it's not no longer no child labour. It's about ensuring that we are maintaining our balance as much as we possibly can. Um, so I, I think that is it's, it's understanding that balance and then understanding that consumption can lead to this abuse and how do we affect our own categories about how we affect our own consumption. Um, you know, asking ourselves, do we need to consume that? Can we go to basics? I remember one of the conversations I had with a, a guy who um, was up in Manchester when I was working on a social housing contract. And he said the most sustainable thing you can do and the most climate friendly thing you can do is build a house properly. Build a house that's got doors and space. Build a house, windows and space. Build a house. None of this great big technology, none of this new, new gas, none of this new stuff. Just build it properly in the first place. Um, because we have degraded the way that we buy a lot of things um, and looked at our consumption perhaps got lazy in the way that we do it. So I think Paul's right. We need to have a think about the fact that this has been going on a really, really long time. We have to challenge not just the fact that we go out and buy these things, we challenge what we're buying. Um, I think that's important. And that's a really good segue to one of the questions I've got. It's kind of a bit of a $64 million question. How do we ensure that low carbon, zero carbon lifestyle is accessible to everyone? That it's the just transition, the fair transition, inclusion, all of those words. And it's, it's so um, appropriate at the moment. I'm sure many of you have read in the news recently about, you know, today and yesterday about the government um, creating a £5,000 grant for air source heat pumps for uh, home owners in the UK. When you dig into some of the numbers, though, it becomes a little a uh, bit um, less appealing maybe, if that's a way of putting it politically correctly, if the average cost of an air source heat pump for the full installation is somewhere between 10 and 15,000 pounds, the grant is 5,000 pounds. So immediately you're asking people to stump up at least half, you know, the same amount again, if not more. Um, and that's quite a lot of money for many families. And then you drill into it a bit further and you realise that the grant will only cover 90,000 households out of a UK household um, population of 28 million households. So I suppose the wider question uh, to my uh, two guests, I'll come to Matt first, is, you know, that's just one example that we've seen in the news lately about trying to push ahead on lower carbon, zero carbon, and it's applauded, but it's just not maybe going as far as possible or it's not as just and fair as we've been talking about. What else can we do? What else should we be doing to to ensure that it's accessible to everybody. Yeah, that's no, a good point. I think I think well, what they're trying to do is trying to just kickstart that industry, aren't they, by by increasing demand. So um, uh, yeah, bit of a challenge there. I mean, yeah, not sure I've got the answers to that. I mean, certainly, you know, the the I understand that the the cost of electric vehicles are due to are, are due to hit kind of price parity with sort of their sort of diesel counterparts within the next five or eight years so that makes it that makes it slightly slightly um more affordable um you know yeah electric vehicles you know i think there almost needs to be a behavior shift doesn't there you know do we all does do people in do you know people who work in uh, and and live in urban environments do they all need vehicles you know, you know should we really be doing you know more walking uh, using public transport, active travel, you know, there's, well, you know, we've talked about kind of human rights and modern slavery today, but actually there's the health issues mm. associated mm. With, with, with our current lifestyle. So maybe, maybe we should kind of really shift towards, you know, more public transport, insulation of trams, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess there's some other challenges out there as well, really. So I haven't really answered your question, James. No, no, it's, it's, it's not a problem at all. I'm not, not, uh, not expecting a, because if you have got the answer, then great, we'll all come knocking on your door very much. Um, I'm looking at the clock and seeing we've got three or four minutes left. I suppose my final question is for the listeners out there, what's the one thing that they could do today or tomorrow uh, um, to start dealing with some of the issues that you've been talking about today? Um, Helen, if I come to you first and then, then Matt. Um, yeah, what, what's, what's one thing they could do within their, uh, within their organisation that would start addressing some of the, the points that we've been talking about today? As a procurement person, I would say start to understand how the supply chain impacts on what they do every day. Um, and I understand where they're already having conversations around transparency in supply chains because of today's pressures, um, today's pressures around HDV drivers, materials, labour shortages. You're already having these conversations around your supply chain. You're trying to understand what it's doing and providing start to overlay that with conversations around the human rights and expectations conversation um, and you know 
when I come to talk about um, human rights and modern slavery, have the conversation with your with your colleagues. Um, 40.3 million people currently victims of exploitation across the globe. 100,000 in the UK. Um, that's a significant number. Um, go and start talking those stats with some of your colleagues and increase awareness. It's scary how the awareness still isn't out there yet, the way that it should be. Start that narrative, start that conversation. Um, and actually that's how we start to make the change um, and start to get it into those business discussions as well. At the risk of me standing like I'm starting a course. But I think it's a good way to softly, softly raise awareness. It's one area where I haven't had anybody who doesn't care. Um, so it's just turning that narrative into something small baby steps and from a personal perspective download the car wash app that you can get um, with regards to um, car washes where you feel people may be being exploited it's one of the biggest contributors in the UK at the moment um, and you can report those and just have a look at your own personal habits a little bit as well because it's um, slave free uh, sorry slaveryfootprint.org um, I'll put that link out go and have a look and see how much you're consuming on a daily basis everybody is considering something that involves slavery and exploitation. So there's about six things there for you to do, um, but hopefully all in that general, general direction. That's great, Helen. Would you mind just dropping those into the chat box whilst I ask the same question of Matt? Because I'm sure some people would love to go and look at some of those resources. Uh, Matt, your, your thoughts? Yeah, sure. I think it's, you know, look at your supply chain, um, look at your areas of spend, do a risk assessment. There's some tools that I'm sure you can get from the supply chain uh, sustainability school. Um, yeah, and then just reiterate Helen's points really. Have a conversation internally. You know, I've had quite a few of these conversations over the last 24 months around, around modern slavery. Helen's right, everybody does care about people. Um, and yeah, have the conversation and then start to have the conversation with your suppliers. Um, they they will be they will be interested. You know, there's there's a you know there's a shared collective rep reputational risk there, isn't there? So, and there's also a competitive advantage. This is the this is the direction of travel in terms of, you know, clients and client organisations are going to be asking more questions around this going forward. So there is a uh, kind of a, a business proposition there as well. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a great uh, message to leave it on. Thanks, Matt. Um, thank you to my two uh, speakers, to Helen and to Matt. I uh, hope you found that interesting. We've got a couple more events coming up, uh, one a month, basically, on the Action Sustainability Platform. So on the 4th of November, we're doing a webinar on zero carbon buildings and the retrofit challenge. I mentioned a minute ago, there's something like 28 million households in the UK. Uh, those will all be there, or a lot of them will be there in 50 years time. The retrofit challenge on carbon is a huge one. Uh, it's not just about new build. Uh, and then on the 1st of December, we're going to be talking about sustainability strategies more widely, which touches upon a lot of what we've talked about today. How do you build that inclusive, holistic, joined up strategy to deal with all your sustainability issues? Um, you can register for those on the AS website. I'll put the link in the chat box. Um, but uh, that's all for now. So thank you very much to my speakers again, and we'll see you again sometime soon. Thanks now. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.